Well, hello everybody out there in YouTube land. Jay Kladek here again. This particular video is kind of geared more towards those individuals that are not necessarily model kit builders. Um, two years ago I did a video on uh, kind of like a little guide to buying model kits as gifts, uh, specifically for the holiday season, Christmas, or birthdays, or the like. Well, uh, considering this year, 2015, uh, this is the season for Star Wars, and so this is a little something to get those of you that are relative newcomers to the Star Wars universe up to speed on what to look for when uh, purchasing kits. Um, reason I point that out is... Star Wars, of course, is not a new thing. Since the movie came out in 1977, there's been a ton of merchandising done. Model kits are but one facet of a much larger world. And as a result, we have had four major manufacturers of model kits since that time. And multiple kits of the same subject done by all companies involved. In fact, I was doing a little research before shooting this and I found out that there are no less than 12 licensed model kits of X-Wings out there of which you can see three in this video and for a ship like the Millennium Falcon there is also no less than uh, 12 licensed model kits of of that subject as well that's a lot of stuff so this is for the wives, the girlfriends, the, the boyfriends, um, the parents. Just to give you an idea of what's out there and what makes one manufacturer's kits potentially more appealing to some people than others. Anyway, as you can see, I've got a nice cross-section of subjects from the original trilogy and you know, one from uh, Lucas's prequel trilogy. Uh, 1977 is when it all began. The uh, first model company to do Star Wars kits was uh, MPC. They were based out of Michigan at the time. Model Plastics Corporation is what they were known as. At the time they were connected with the, uh, the General Mills Group, uh, which, if I recall correctly, also included the, uh, the Kenner Toy Company. Uh, so there was a nice little tie-in there. Kenner got the action figure license and uh, MPC was able to get the model kit license. Well, they did kits from uh, 1977 all the way up until about 1985-86 licensed kits. And then after that, a lot of the kits disappeared from shelves about two to three years after Jedi came out in 82-83. Um, but that wasn't the end of them. MPC, as its own individual company, was purchased by the Ertl Corporation, who also owns who also owned AMT at the time. This was circa 1988-89. Uh, and when that happened, they said, well, let's go ahead and reissue uh, some of the uh, Star Wars kits that MPC had done, and we'll call them commemorative series. Um, they rebadged them under a different name, known as AMT, uh, MPC Ertl. That was merely just a transitional title until... MPC Ertl completely merged with AMT Ertl circa 1995. And then after that, any remaining uh, MPC Ertl kits in the line at the time were basically reissued as AMT Ertl subjects. For instance, this uh, flight display TIE Fighter here from AMT Ertl, this uh, was originally offered in this style of box way back during the 1970s. Um, AMT in this case flight display with a with an acrylic display stand disc that's about the only thing they did the plastic molding is identical um, so I'll touch on that in a bit AMT Ertl had the license from 95 and through 2005 they uh, did kits for the prequel series including well they did them for episode 1 Naboo Starfighter, and then they also did, strangely enough, they didn't do any kits for Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, but they did do a couple of kits for Episode 3. Um, a Jedi Starfighter and a T-34 
tank that was uh, a uh, separatist tank that was used in uh, the Battle of Kashyyyk. I don't know why they chose that subject. But uh, after 2005, they let the license lapse. And 1995 also saw, or 2005 also saw the emergence of Ravel, both Ravel of Germany and eventually Ravel USA. Ravel of Germany started doing kits for Episode 3, um, Revenge of the Sith, and then when Erdl lost the license about a year or two later, Ravel USA was able to start importing the Ravel of Germany kits into this country. Um, so Ravel would be kit manufacturer number two. Number three is a Japanese import brand called uh, Fine Molds. They make high quality, um, same scale kits of uh, various Star Wars subjects. And they were, they've been around from doing Star Wars subjects from 2000 until they lost the license at the end of 2013. Uh, but we still have kits available from Japan in the form of uh, Bandai. And Bandai has been producing kits from uh, January 2014 onward, technically late 2013. And so right now we've only got two manufacturers currently making Star Wars kits, Bandai and Ravel. But as you can see, there's a lot of subjects available from the past. Give me a moment and I'll talk to you a little about uh, how each of these different manufacturer series kits are different and why one type of Star Wars kit does not necessarily fit all customers. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the uh, the MPC, MPC Ertl and AMT kit lines. We're talking almost uh, 40 years of kit development, just the same as we've got 40 years of movie development. And, well, kits back then are not exactly the same as they are today. Um, doesn't mean that the kits are bad, mind you. It's just that back then... Um, Tooling was typically designed by hand, and uh, references were not quite as forthcoming. You didn't necessarily have computer scanning of parts and such. But uh, overall, MPC did a decent job with the license back then. The kits were definitely very good for their time, but at the same time, too, we needed to use a little bit more effort to come up with something that looked very much like what the studio models were. I mean, we got the basic shapes and the basic details, but it took a bit more work. Uh, for instance, what a lot of modelers like to do, a, very, a relatively easy modification of this X-Wing kit here is replacing the guns with like brass and uh, plastic tubing, so therefore they were straighter, maybe enhancing some of the parts with actual model kit parts from various subjects to get the details to look right. Um, <clears throat> decal sheets <laughs> yeah this kit's got decals but uh, if I ever get around to building the specific one I'm probably not going to be using these decals at all because chances are they are more than likely to fall apart so it doesn't but this doesn't necessarily mean that the kits are bad and that you should avoid them not far from far from that at all uh, you're for a kit of this vintage, this particular one, it's the vintage Star Wars box, but for Empire Strikes Back, they uh, slapped a big Empire Strikes Back logo on the same box. So this kit is dated circa 1980-81 vintage. Um, where this would appeal to a potential collector or builder in your, in your circle of friends or relatives would be from a collectible standpoint. Uh, this particular one I bought in a uh, bought in a hobby shop a few years ago, and the reason why I got it is because I like the looks of the box art. Will I eventually build it? Maybe I've got another one that I'm actually building, which uh, goes back a little bit further than this. Um, one of the original one of the original run kits without the Empire logo. Um, the beauty of it is, though, is if you're looking for a kit that is a builder and not necessarily a collector like this, then probably what you want to do is look for 
one of the later boxings because the X-Wings, the big X-Wing, the standard X-Wing and the standard TIE Fighter were both reissued multiple times in AMT Ertl packaging um, and even in uh, uh, Return of the Jedi boxing similar to this A-Wing fighter here. The plastic was exactly the same. The only thing that changed a little was I do know what the original MPC Return of the Jedi kits, they used really dark smoke tint plastic for the clear parts where every other kit used uh, clear clear parts. But the plastic was the same. Only benefit for a builder of going for a really early example such as this MPC kit is that the injection tooling for model kits wears with each use. And so a kit like this hasn't had as many uh, parts shot through it as, say, this uh, mid-90s vintage Darth Vader's TIE Fighter here, which was made from molds done at the same time as the X-Wing. So the parts fit might be a little sloppier on this. Therefore, filing, more glue, that type of thing is pretty much going to be a necessity. But if you want somebody that wants something from the original trilogy, these kits are a good option uh, for both building and collectability standpoint simply because, well, they are from that time period and it is nice to see where Star Wars models started rather than necessarily going for uh, where they are today. But um, now in terms of kids or more novice builders, I would probably not recommend uh, buying these for them with maybe a couple of exceptions. Uh, there are some snap together kits that uh, MPC did, this A-Wing fighter for instance. You only find these in MPC and MPC Ertl packaging. I've never seen one done in AMT Ertl packaging. This is the only styrene kit of an A-Wing that I have ever seen. It's a snap together kit. Builds up relatively quick and paints up really nice. Um, the snow speeder here, this is also a relatively good kit for novices. Even if the pilot figures are kind of like more lumps of plastic than actual pilots. <laughs> so, But uh, MPC does provide a nice option. Another thing I'll mention too is there is kind of a little bit of a holy grail in terms of kits that are available from that time period. This uh, AMT Ertl Pro Shop was a was a higher end series that AMT tried to do at the time. Operational features, electronics. Uh, the series only ran for about maybe two years. This was like circa 1998 or 9 I believe until about 2000-2001. And they did this larger new tool X-Wing which had opening wings and uh, circuit board and lights. Uh, actually had some uh, sound effects and some voice. Um, Mahlers like it because it's a little more accurate than the uh, early tool X-Wing. Uh, and therefore these are kind of hard to find because they weren't made as long. Uh, I mean if you shop on secondary sources like eBay and stuff usually chances are you can find later production early version X-Wings for about under $10, maybe even a little less than that. Pro Shop X-Wings, if you find a good one, I'd say expect to pay about $30 or $40, or possibly even higher than that if somebody really thinks they have a uh, <laughs> set of crown jewels in their collection. Um, I'll leave it up to you for how much you want to spend for a gift for your significant other. But the beauty of it is, each of these kits that you see right here did not cost that much to uh, buy at the time and many of them are available for not all that much money. This R2, I've seen examples of this kit go for very high if they've got totally intact box art to something like this second hand one which I think I only paid maybe about twenty dollars for about ten years ago. Okay let's talk a bit about uh, fine molds kits from Japan. Now technically, Fine Molds was the second major manufacturer of Star Wars kits. History of Fine Molds is the company was started up by uh, several individuals in Japan that had formerly worked for other uh, plastic firms there, specifically Hasegawa. In fact, pretty much all of your Japanese manufacturers are based in 
the town, uh, the city of uh, Shizuoka, Japan. So as a result, most every one of the kit designers kind of knew everybody else, or their reputations preceded them. Fine Molds was a smaller company, so it was a major coup when they actually got a hold of the Star Wars license circa 2000-2001. Um, the X-Wing in 172 scale was their very first kit, and this was the one that pretty much showed uh, modelers just what was possible with, uh, with Star Wars, with kit manufacturing for sci-fi subjects. It really raised the bar. Um, so much so that uh, other companies took notice. Not all the lessons were learned by them. The, the thing that makes a fine molds kit different from an FPC kit is, well, for one thing, you get a lot more parts. I've got some uh, pieces parts in here from actually a couple of X-Wings in this box. I've stashed some decals from a second kit. But um, quality of the moldings improved quite a bit. Um, this is a totally unique tool, not based on anything that was done by any other manufacturer at the time. And most importantly for uh, many scale modelers, Fine Molds was the first company to actually do constant scale kits. The big problem with MPC kits, and even the Ravel kits of today, is pretty much the scales are all over the map. Some subjects might be close to 172 scale, others might be close to 148 scale. See my other video for an explanation of scale. And uh, as a result, it was really, really tough to uh, combine models and dioramas, either on the ground or in-flight displays. Had to take a little bit of uh, creativity to do that. Now, toward the end of its run, AMT was actually starting to do some constant scale kits, but they uh, lost the license before they really had a chance to exploit that for all it was worth, and at the same time, too, they weren't likely to uh, tool up another X-Wing in 148 scale, simply because they already had two or three other X-Wing kits available at the time. 172 scale, being the most popular scale in Japan, was a very good choice. Beauty of it is, is somebody could actually build an X-Wing model, put it on display next to a uh, World War II Spitfire or an F-15 Eagle model kit in the same scale, and you get an idea what the actual size, quote unquote, of the full size subject was. Um, very, very good kit design, in my humble opinion. And these were the benchmark. In some cases, I think. The quality of these kits may not be surpassed, although Bandai is definitely trying to make us forget fine molds. Uh, they, did a, they did a lot of very cool subjects over the years during their 13-year uh, run. X-Wing was first. They did a TIE Fighter, then a TIE Interceptor. They did an X-Wing Fighter on 148 scale. And the, the one kit that pretty much kind of became the benchmark of the whole series was the 172 scale Millennium Falcon and this kit was made up of over 800 pieces and at the time it costed about $200 um, very expensive and so a lot of a lot of modelers weren't sure they wanted to buy a kit that expensive but a lot of us did I did I actually built and finished mine it was just the empty box. So as a result, when uh, Fine Molds lost the license at the end of the 2013 Christmas season, a lot of us uh, were not too thrilled with that. But don't worry, because there are three of the kits that Fine Molds has done. The Big Millennium Falcon, the 148 scale X-Wing, and the 148 scale TIE Fighter are actually coming out in the in the Ravel kit line as part of a new series called Ravel Master series. They're not going to be cheap, uh, but the plastic is the same. There have been some minor improvements on the decals, uh, so if you were not able to get a fine molds kit before of this thing, you can get one again. Um, for those of you that are looking for the vintage kits, either for yourself or as gifts. Uh, the prices have been climbing on the secondary market, on eBay and such. 
these things are up to three hundred dollars, which is one of the reasons why uh, Ravel is pricing their reissue at three hundred dollars. Um, the X wings haven't really climbed in price so much, but some of the kits that only fine molds is done and won't ever get reissued, like the Jedi Starfighter or the Naboo Starfighter. Those kits, which might have sold for maybe about twenty to thirty when they were brand new, are probably climbing up into about the fifty to sixty dollar range. But I mean, if you want to sprinkle a little better quality kit into your significant other stocking, or uh, put a put a nice present under the tree, these are a good investment, kit wise. And there's enough unique subjects out there to definitely make it worth your while to find one as a gift for somebody who builds Star Wars but maybe doesn't have them. You gotta spend a bit more, but they are out there. Now let's talk a little bit about Ravel kits. In 2005, Ravel of Germany actually got a uh, European exclusive license for Star Wars kits, and they did a full-on merchandising blitz, releasing, if I recall correctly, no less than five different kits from the movie Revenge of the Sith, All-Terrain Recon Transport, ARC-170 Fighter, uh, two versions of the Jedi Starfighter, and um, a large, yeah, let's see, Droid Tri-Fighter, and then a, a large kit of the uh, Venerator class Star Destroyer, which is the only glue-together kit in the entire Ravel Star Wars kit line. Um, after AMT Ertl will lost the license at the end of uh, 2006 or so, Ravel USA picked up the license and actually started uh, reboxing the kits in their own packaging. Uh, so some things changed a little, but uh, the plastic in the kits is the same. I mean, Ravel Germany kits, usually you can recognize those on eBay because they typically say like a Ravel Easy kit, whereas uh, Ravel USA kits would say probably Ravel Snap Tight or snap tight max. Um, as I said, the only Ravel glue together kit that was done in this entire line was the Venerator class Star Destroyer from Revenge of the Sith, and that's also the only one that requires paint. Every, every other kit in the Ravel line features pre-painted parts. Um, the advantage is uh, younger, less experienced modelers can get these things built and not have to worry about painting them. They can do uh, all they, they can do some nice weathering effects on the models to get them to look really nice. Drawback is, is if anybody wants to paint them, they don't have any decals either. So it means uh, resorting to the decal aftermarket or strictly putting on the marking markings with paint. Um, Quality-wise, the kits are pretty good. I mean, they are some nice, they are nicely tooled. Uh, the only drawback is, is again, like the uh, MPC kits of old, the scales are all over the map. But if you've got a uh, Star Wars collector or model builder that you're trying to find a gift for, these do offer quite a nice variety, and there's also all sorts of price points as well. Um, for instance, this kit of the X-Wing Fighter, when it originally came out, was about 20 bucks. Some outlets are selling them for about 30 now. I don't know why. I really don't think the kit is worth $30. By the way, they're also putting it in a flat-style box like this uh, Land Speeder. But believe me, it is exactly the same kit where it is in the small box or whether it's in one of these larger boxes. Uh, the most expensive kit in the traditional... Uh, Re Ravel snap tight line is this big X wing right here, which scales out to about 1 29th scale. It's pretty large. In fact, it is the largest dedicated styrene X wing kit that has ever been done as a license kit. It's even bigger than the uh, the, the Pro Shop kit, which scaled to about 1 35th scale. Um, by comparison, for stocking stuffers, you've got small kits like the uh, the easy kit pocket snap kits in fact uh, both of these kits right here this tie interceptor and the snow speeder these are both pocket snap kits if this one was sold in the UK 
it'd be packaged or Europe it would be packaged like this and the tire interceptor has been offered in packaging like this as well now I did mention that that big star destroyer was the only one that requires paint well as I understand it um, Ravella Germany actually has been uh, offering some of these uh, some of the earlier pocket snaps in as totally undecorated kits hopefully with some decals in them for some of them that need them like the X-Wing but that is nice and actually these pocket snaps in some ways I like them a little bit better than these bigger ones mainly because all these bigger kits right here if they have pilot figures they are uh, molded in a rubbery vinyl plastic and as a result you can't paint those with enamel paints you gotta use acrylics plus also if you try cleaning the seams off of them usually it's a little difficult because the uh, the rubbery vinyl just likes to uh, kind of gall up it doesn't like to clean up cleanly when you sand them so but the pocket snaps they do have the ones that have pilot figures they do have plastic pilots which can be built glued and painted using uh, traditional enamels and acrylic paints um, like I said biggest ver the biggest variety you're gonna find is in this line the kit line has been around for about uh, 10 years and you got subjects there from uh, the, uh, the the Clone Wars uh, series you've got stuff from the original trilogy even got some uh, stuff that dates almost back to the uh, to the prequels um, at least a couple of Clone Wars subjects that could be backdated to the prequels and these guys are also the uh, Ravel and Bandai are the only two companies doing episode 7 kits because they're the only two companies that have got the kit license as a result these are probably the the most widely available kits you're gonna find in stores um, so there's a lot of different ones out there by the way one other thing I'm gonna mention if you notice this kit this kit this kit the packaging all looks different Lucasfilm licensing is a little strange in that apparently it seems like once every six months to a year they dictate whoever has a kit license to put the stuff out in new packaging um, like I said this is what was out there circa 2007 in fact this uh, fine molds X-Wing dates from that time period and as you can see both of them are using the same similar style packaging with the uh, Star Wars logo up here and a Darth Vader mask up there a few months later it changed you've got um, Clone Wars logos um, when this land speeder kit came out about a year and a half ago you had Darth Maul on there um, so reason why I point that out is <clears throat> if you see the same kit in different box art the only thing that has changed is the box art the contents of the kit are exactly the same the instructions are exactly the same you're not getting anything different other than the box art and it does lead to some confusion for instance this X-Wing right here brand new kit I just got this thing last week it's got Kylo Ren from episode 7 in there however it's an X-Wing from the original trilogy uh, to my knowledge uh, the original trilogy X-Wings do not appear in this new movie except as junked spacecraft on the uh, the surface of the planet Jakku hopefully that wasn't a spoiler there for you there watching uh, but because of Lucasfilm licensing they have to go by this uh, style of packaging they couldn't do packaging that was reminiscent to the original trilogy so basically it's like a form of branding and give it about six months to a year if this kit is still in production and they're making uh, newer versions of that kit chances are the box art's going to change so just be ready for it plastic wise it's identical and finally we come to the fourth manufacturer of Star Wars kits Bandai now as I said Bandai got the uh, Star Wars license at the end of 2013 the start of 2014 and over the past year or so they've been coming out with some very very nice kits um, 
They started out doing original trilogy stuff, X-Wing Starfighter and Darth Vader's TIE Advance in 172 scale. They're also doing uh, 48 scale stuff. They've done a 48 scale lighted X-Wing. They've even done a 48 scale ATST Scout Walker. But probably what's going to appeal most to uh, fans of the current movie series is they've uh, is that they are doing kits from Episode Seven. The first two that they have done are the Millennium Falcon in 1144 scale. This one. And a 172 scale version of the uh, T-70 Resistance X-wing fighter. They've got more on the way. They're even doing. They've even done a couple of larger scale droid kits. The sky's the limit with these guys. Now, reason why these appeal to uh, model makers across the board is they're done in a constant scale, either 1/144th, 172, or 148 scale, or even bigger in the case of the droids. Um, detailing on the kits is very, very good. You get both uh, sticker sheets or water slide decal sheets. And you also get pre-molded parts, many of them on the uh, same parts trees. Now, in a sense, I think these kits are maybe a little bit over-engineered, and they're certainly over-engineered compared to the... Uh, fine molds kits that they uh, that they replace but that being said they do build very very well you just got to take your time and do them and they do uh, have some simplified features that would appeal to a uh, novice modeler but there's enough detail there that a uh, intermediate to expert modeler can just have a lot of fun with them now there is uh, there are a couple of drawbacks to uh, the Bandai kits and that is their availability. Back when Lucasfilm was running things on their own, um, there seemed to be a, uh, how should I say it, a somewhat relaxed attitude related towards importing and exporting uh, model kits from different regions. The Bandai kits here are a uh, Japanese market ex and Asian market exclusive only. Um, but with the help of uh, vendors like uh, Hobbylink Japan and even some uh, U.S. vendors that were able to pipeline them in, Cult TV Man, Starship Modeler, uh, we were able to get fine molds kits in this country reasonably easily. Um, getting them from Japan meant we had to pay a little bit more shipping, but it was not a problem. Uh, however, not too long ago, with the uh, the pre-sale of uh, the Bandai Episode 7 kits, um, there was a mandate that came down uh, from Disney that Bandai had to enforce their Japanese domestic sale-only copyrights. So pretty much, practically every major Japanese vendor that would export kits to other regions could no longer offer any of the Bandai kits for sale, with the possible exception of what they had already taken pre-orders for. And that really uh, created quite, quite a mess. That being said, it is still possible to get the Bandai kits because there are a lot of middle-level vendors that are fully willing to uh, sell to the U.S. In fact, I was able to get both of these here from uh, different Amazon vendors, Amazon.com. And shipping options were very nice. You could either get them via slow shipping method uh, by surface only. You could go by uh, surfaced air freight, also known as SAL, where they would ship them by air to the States and then from there they would go on a truck and uh, transport to where you are. Or the more expensive but very, very quick expedited media service, also known as EMS. And as a result, I was able to get these kits within a week of them coming out. Had to pay a lot for the shipping, about uh, 20 bucks each, but well, that's the price you pay. Um, the other drawback uh, with the Bandai kits is that because these are not officially exportable into this country, if you have a damaged part or a missing part, uh, you're kind of on your own to uh, get replacements. The Revell US kits, if you are missing parts on those, you can easily call Revell or email them and they'll be happy to uh, send out a replacement part to you. That being said though, it's 
very, very rare that you'd ever come across a uh, missing part in one of these Bandai kits. The sprue trees are very well designed, the bags are very well packaged, and most of your Japanese vendors do do a good job in uh, packaging these to uh, ship them over. Um, but these are something unique. The other, the other minor drawback is the fact that since these are Japanese domestic market, the instructions are pretty much all in Japanese with very, very little English. But anybody that's ever built a model kit realizes the layout, how to assemble these kits, and also um, where to put paint, where to put glue. Although, funny enough, all these Bandai kits are designed to be snapped together. They don't require glue. I still recommend glue to hold the pieces together so they don't fall apart. But you can build them as a snap tight if you want to. But anyway, I'll conclude there. Hopefully you've uh, come away with a nice understanding of uh, what is available out there as far as Star Wars kits. Might be a little bit late for Christmas season, but I've got a feeling that uh, with uh, Episode 7 coming out and further Star Wars kits coming down the line, that... There's probably going to be the collector or builder in your life that's going to want these if they don't have them already, and hopefully this will allow you to navigate the myriad of kit options out there. Um, just to recap, MPC kits, probably better for your more experienced modelers or box art collectors, uh, but there are some subjects out there that build up really, really nice, and they're readily available for relatively inexpensive prices. Fine molds kits, prices are climbing in value, but the quality of those kits is very, very good if you can find them. Three kits are coming out uh, under the, quote, Revell Master Series. The big fine molds Millennium Falcon, the 48-scale X-Wing, and the 48-scale TIE Fighter. Those three kits are, being, are going to be available from Revell USA domestically. In fact, as I am recording this, the fine molds... Falcon is already out under the Ravel Master Series, and we will see the uh, the X-Wing and the TIE Fighter come out uh, pretty much by the end of the year, early January. Um, Ravel USA, the most numerous that you're going to find right now, and even the Ravel Germany stuff. Um, like MPC, scales are all over the map, but they're readily available. There's plenty of subjects, and they and Bandai are the only two companies that are doing Episode 7 kits. You're not going to find an Episode 7 kit from either Fine Molds or MPC. Not unless one of those companies had a time machine that I don't know about. But in any event, that's what I've got. Uh, feel free to check out my other videos. And uh, if you are buying a kit for somebody that is a raw novice, check out my other video on buying model kits as gifts. I talk about how much you'd be looking to spend in addition to the plastic uh, if you are buying for somebody that has never built a kit before. That'll give you some education and hopefully you can come up with the right subject. Um, that being said, even if you're just buying for a collector, these kits are very nice to collect. Value-wise, will they go up in value? Can't really say. You get other, you get other uh, value from them that is different from monetary value in my humble opinion box art, packaging, and just the nostalgia quality. But anyway, go out, buy some kits, and uh, here's to a good 2016. Have fun.